this man walked into this room. Are we grateful? Just in your ministry is a powerful thing among us here, and we're so grateful you're here, man. We love you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Matt Holtzman, and I'm the Minister of Young Families and Pastoral Care here at First Pres, and I just welcome you into worship on this very unique day in the life of our congregation. This is Life After Death Sunday. And uh, as Katie said, this is uh, a Sunday that comes yearly for us. It's usually the Sunday, it is the Sunday right after Easter, uh, where we celebrate those uh, people who have died in the past year, since last Easter. And so those were the names uh, that we were read here just moments ago. You know, it's hard to believe, but there were 62 names uh, on that on, on, on the screen, and it's hard for us to be able to imagine that, but it's almost like if you took half of one of these middle sections of the pews, it's about that many people, actually, that left us last year. You know, I can remember the first year that I was here as a worship leader and approaching Life After Death Sunday, and uh, thinking it was a great, you know, a great opportunity for us to be able to celebrate the resurrection. What a glorious thing to be able to do Easter and then the very next Sunday come back and look at the resurrection. It makes sense, you know. And as a green worship leader, I entered into the scene here and the names came up on, you know, while we were leading music. And I, I didn't really connect, you know, with exactly what was going on because I wasn't relationally connected with a lot of these people that were being scrolled. And maybe some of you here today are, are having that experience, which is okay. But I got to let you know, after being here now for five years, um, each year it gets a little harder, you know, because now I'm reading names that I was in relationship with. Now I'm reading names, some that I even had the privilege of walking al alongside of them during their final hours uh, on earth here. And so I come into this, this, uh, this Sunday with a little bit of a mix of emotion, you know? And maybe some of you have come into this very room uh, with a similar, similar feeling, you know? The people that we have come to know and love are no longer with us. And the sense of loss that's among us, it's, it's not something that's just up here. It's a real loss, isn't it? And perhaps, the, you know, perhaps we're sad or we're grieving and we kind of thought, you know, by now maybe we should be over it. We would kind of hope that by now, you know, so-and-so may have passed away months ago and so here we are, especially after Easter, we should be getting over it, right? But no, the grief lingers on sometimes. Um, and it is a real thing for us. Last year during Life After Death Sunday, there was a name that came up on the screen uh, that kind of took my breath away. And it was Cliff Anderson. And Cliff, how many of you all remember Cliff? Look at that. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead and just keep your arms up for a moment. And Mary, will you look around for a minute? This is Mary, Cliff's uh, widow right over here. And um, Mary is such a blessing uh, to, to me and my family uh, today uh, because the very same spirit that was in Cliff of mentoring and walking alongside uh, young ministers like myself, Mary has the same spirit, which I'm just so grateful. But Cliff was, uh, uh, he was gold, you know? And when he died, many of us were left here with a mix of emotion, weren't we? Uh, we knew that Cliff was now in the very presence of God. Amen. And so we celebrated the fact that he was no longer plagued with multiple myeloma uh, that he had been struggling with for years. But he was now in the very glorious presence of Jesus. Amen. And so we did celebrate that. But for some reason, it didn't actually eliminate or take the place of our grief. Both of those things kind of went right parallel with each other. And so there we were in a mix of emotion. Cliff was both in glory and he was gone. C.S. Lewis puts it this way in his book, A Grief Observed After the Loss of His Wife. We were promised sufferings. They were a part of the program. We were even told, blessed are they who mourn. And I accepted it. I've got nothing that I hadn't bargained for. Of course, it is different. 
when the thing happens to oneself and not to others, and in reality, not in imagination. We know this to be true, don't we? When loved ones we have come to cherish in this life are suddenly gone from our sight, we're left shocked and staggered. And sometimes we're even angry, angry at God, oftentimes. Sometimes we're confused, and sometimes we're helpless, which leads to a sense of hopelessness as well. And all of this leads to a place for us oftentimes where we are hungering and thirsting, longing for solid ground. Well, in our scripture passage today, Paul is reminding the people of Corinth where the solid ground lies. At this point, the church has somewhat lost sight of the hope that lies within the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul recognized that the Corinthian church needed this foundational reminder, and perhaps we do as well today, even on Life After, Day Sunday, uh, Life, uh, After Death Sunday. So let's look at the scripture together. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 12. And before we go there again together, I would invite you to pray with me. And let's ask for the Lord's guidance. Lord Jesus, you are the author of our faith. And we thank you for the gift of your word. And as we think on these things, open up our hearts and our minds to hear your word to us. Father, remind us once again of the hope that is your gospel. And may we now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, rediscover the power of your resurrection in our lives. We pray this in the holy name of Christ Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Starting in verse 12, let's look at our verse again here together. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Now, right here, before we go even a, a, a word more, we need to understand the context for which Paul is writing. He's writing into a Greek context. And buried really deep in the psyche and in the mind of every Greek at that time was the idea that the body, the physical body, was actually a, um, a jail. It was actually something that your soul was incarcerated in. And the soul would be freed from jail one day if the soul was, was good. But the body in of itself for the Greek was not something necessarily worth being resurrected. Uh, they would actually see that as abomination. They would see it as something uh, offensive for them. So this whole idea of the resurrection was something that they really didn't want to wrap their minds around. It wasn't even something they wanted to be desired for the, for the normal Greek. However, Paul goes right to the core of the gospel itself, and he picks up the argument right at its claim. And he says, okay, well, if there is no resurrection of the dead, meaning the body, well, then not even Christ has been raised from the dead. Hmm. Going back even to the beginning of chapter 15, Paul reminds the church of the importance of holding firmly to the gospel of Christ. And, and also he says later that it should be of first importance on your mind, these things that I have taught to you, because they're the very foundation of your life. They're the very bedrock of the faith itself. And if you take away the linchpin or that very bedrock of the faith of the, Christ, of the resurrection, that is the resurrection of the Christian walk, then you take away everything that is built upon that foundation. And so the Christian faith has no worth whatsoever. And Paul's reminding his readers here that this is, this is really important for you to continue to grasp the resurrection of Christ. He goes on now in verse 14, and he picks up and listen to what the ramifications are if there was no resurrection of Christ. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. Yikes. <laughs> I should pack it up and go home, right? Let's close in prayer. Actually, we don't need to pray because it doesn't matter anyway. We can just all go. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. He reiter reiterates the fact. 
Paul's continuing to make a case here that truly if Christ's body has not been raised, then the good news of the gospel is no news at all. Everything that the Corinthian church was staking their lives on was nothing. Continuing in verse 17, he goes on, and if Christ has not been raised, more ramifications, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ or who've died in Christ are lost or have perished. If only for this life we have hope, and this is how he sums it up, if only for this life we have hope. We are of all people most to be pitied. Here Paul paints a picture of true despair, and he almost does it in such a way to where it feels like he's going from bad news to the worst news of all. Bad news number one, your faith, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, your faith is futile. It's meaningless. Anything that you believe about Christ and the goodness of Christ that comes with the resurrection, nothing. Faith is futile. More bad news. Number two, you are still in your sins. The very thing that Christ died for and rose again from the dead to totally take care of for us. Well, actually, that's not true. You're still in your sin. And the fallen world that you are a part of before the resurrection, before B.C., still B.C. There's no A.D. If there is no resurrection, you're still in your sin. Worst news of all, number three, and this applies for us today especially, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are what? Lost. These people who profess faith and stake their very lives on Christ who have died, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then those people who have fallen asleep or who have died have perished. Verse 19, Paul sums it up that if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people out of everyone in the world, most to be pitied. And then the turn. Verse 20, I'm so grateful for verse 20. Let's read it together, okay? Here we go. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. I love that. Don't you love that? I'm so grateful for verse 20. Can you imagine what our lives would look like if we were to be able to live in the buts of Scripture? Yes, I did just say that. The buts of Scripture. Here's some more buts of Scripture for your listening ears, okay? My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. His anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Say it with me. Weeping may stay for the night, rejoicing comes in the morning. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. Amen. The grass withers and the flowers fall. The word of the Lord endures forever. Come on, Timothy. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. If only for this life, we have hope in Christ. We are of all people most to be pitied, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Wow. Before we go even a word more here, I wanna ask you a question. Do you believe it? Yes. Do you believe it? Yes. It's good news if you do, because if you believe in the resurrection of Christ, then all of the faith is built upon that, that linchpin, that bedrock of everything. And you are hold fast to the Father because of this. Much is to be gained, not only in the here and now of this life, but also in the life to come. Hope is made available to us. Katie spoke of that even just a little while ago in her prayer. 
There is a humongous difference now between hope and optimism, is there? Okay, I was talking about this with, uh, with a pastor friend of mine actually this week about hope and versus optimism. Do you know the difference? Optimism is this, being optimistic about something is basically the idea of looking at your circumstances and then making your own positive judgment as to how things will turn out. So you look at your circumstances and you just go, well, well I guess I'll just look for the best in these. Now hope, on the other hand, comes into view when you acknowledge God who transcends your circumstances. And he gives you hope out of that as you acknowledge him. You see, if Christ was not raised from the dead, the big or the best thing we could live with moving forward would be an optimistic viewpoint going forward. For the church in Corinth, if, if Christ was not truly raised from the dead, they would still be in their sins, their faith futile, mean nothing. The loved ones that they once upon knew in this life perished. And that, that would be all they would have. And they would almost want to take the advice of Paul later in 1 Corinthians. He says, hey, if Christ has not been resurrected from the dead, let's eat and drink, you know, uh, for tomorrow we die. This is all we got. So let's just go outside, you know. Again, let's close in prayer. Right? We don't need to pray because it doesn't matter. We're just going to go and make our lives the way that we want them to look. But... Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. And so therefore, we have hope. Amen. Hope becomes our reality. Hope becomes our way forward in living out this life. And also, hope becomes our reality in the life to come. I want to leave you guys with three things today. And before we leave here this morning, I want to give you these three things. First is this. We have a living hope. A living hope. It's here today. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5 says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because of Jesus' resurrection, we are no longer in sin. We have been set free. The sin that once ruled over us has totally met its match and has been defeated once and for all. And while the battle rages on with sin, right? We just, re uh, we just sang, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. How many of you are prone to wander? Okay. That wasn't many of you. I didn't know we were so perfect. <laughs> oh, there you are. Even though we continue with our battle against sin, sin has not won the war. Amen. Christ has. Before the throne of God above, we just sang this a little while ago, verse 2. Let me remind you. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, and here is our hope, my sinful soul is what? Counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Praise God. The hope that Jesus gives is alive right now in the midst of our struggle with sin. And because of his resurrection, 1 John 1, 9 says this, when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is such good news. Have you received it? Have you received the news? You are a forgiven people. And if you don't know the forgiveness of Christ, might this be the day that you walk into forgiveness for the first time? The second thing about Christ's resurrection is this, and we need to be reminded of this, especially today. We all will die one day. Amen. The day will come for every single one of us where we will find ourselves in the final hour of this life. This life that we know now will come to an end for all of us. Last I checked, it was still 100%, right? The death rate. And someday, our name might actually be on that screen. And when that day comes, the desire to know what happens next 
is on our head, is on our minds oftentimes i can tell you in my ministry over the past year i've walked alongside many people that have one foot in this world and they have their other foot in the next and they're in transition and maybe you yourself know of people that are in this place right now there might be people even online that are watching this that might be right there right in this place right in this very moment it becomes so very important for us in the final hour of life to know that hope is alive Amen. and it's there too right in that moment Jesus is there, and it is a hope that extends way beyond the physical life, those who have professed and confessed Christ as Lord of their life. Just moments before Jesus would raise Lazarus up from the dead, he said these words to his family members standing nearby. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. What assurance, right? What assurance. On this day where we acknowledge friends and family who have gone to be with the Lord, we must point one another also to the eternity that lies out ahead of us beyond this brief life that we have here on earth. It's a fragile time that we're in. Have you trusted Jesus with your life? Might this be the day that you do this if you have not done it yet? The last thing I want to remind you and leave you with this morning, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not only do we have a living hope that is with us today that helps us conquer sin in our, in our battle against it, not only do we have an eternal hope in heaven that awaits, awaits us after we die, but the last reminder that I want everyone to hear is this. Jesus is coming back. Do you want me to prove it to you? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Revelation 21, three through five. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order has passed away. He who was seated on the throne, Jesus said, I am making everything new. You see, we are all awaiting something that far surpasses what we could possibly imagine in this life. And our God is in the business of making everything new. And so we await the day where the current order of things as we now know it will soon pass away. That can scare some people, but for those of us that have a hope in Christ and know the story is not yet done, there's hope there. Jesus is coming back. Can you imagine it? I mean, really, let's just take a moment. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? In the twinkling of an eye, in the flash, we're all going to hear a trumpet sound. And it's not going to be like a trumpet you hear at 829.45 here. I think it's actually going to be an enormous trumpet that we've never even heard a sound before. And the clouds are going to split, and Jesus is going to come poke his head through. And for, for somehow, everybody is going to see him. I don't know that, how that works, but it's going to happen. Hope. Back to the story of Cliff, <clears throat> and I want to close with this. Cliff, uh, in his final days here, he was suffering. He was suffering a lot. And um, I remember, Mary, having a conversation with you, too, after he had passed away, of you saying something along the lines of, now I understand what it means to look at someone and see that they are being made like Christ in their sufferings. You remember that? He became like Christ somehow in his sufferings. It's a suffering uh, very deep, and very core. And Cliff was there at, at the end. But I also remember looking Cliff in the eyes 
And again, him talking about what was coming and the hope that anchored him, even in that moment. And before Cliff passed away, I, I ended up finishing a song that I ended up singing at his memorial service. And I want to close with it today to remind us that this life is not all that there is. And furthermore, that heaven is not all that there is late either. We await something so glorious that God wants to open up and show us when the day arrives. But I want to play this song for you, and as I do, I would pray to you that you don't just hear it as a song that uh, would be for a person that has one foot in this world and another foot in the next. In some ways, we're all there, aren't we? We don't know the hour. We're all there. So I pray that these words might actually be something that you would be able to allow impact your heart and maybe the position of where you are with the Lord at this time too. Just a little while longer and I'm going home to stay. Just a little while longer and this pain will pass away. Just a little more time and I'll be fine. Just a little while longer. Just a little while longer and I'll breathe my final breath. Just a little while longer and they'll lay me down to rest. Just a little more time and I'll leave this world behind. Just a little while longer. a little while longer and the soul in me will rise just a little while longer and my faith will be my eyes just a little more time and glory will shine just a little
the sting of death is dead and gone. There we'll see our Savior's face. Yeah, holy in my Lord's embrace. Let's all stand together, give glory to Him. Sing it to Him. And we look forward, Lord, to the day that you will return. And in the meantime, Father, we place all of our hope, all of our trust in you, the resurrected Christ, Savior, Jesus, and all of God's people said, amen. Continue in worship, man.
Oh, it's so good to be in worship with all of you. So good. You know, if you have been here and you've been listening to the sermon, singing these songs, and you're going, I don't know him. I don't know him. Let's get to know him today. We'd, I'd love to be able to talk with you. If, you. if this is the day that you would like to start uh, an eternal life with Christ, we would love to talk with you. Katie, myself, Timothy, anybody who might be on the side of you who knows this life, let this day be the day for you. And take now the benediction. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Help me. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. He is risen. Go in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Amen.